Salutations, people. Welcome to Page Three Killers, Murders That Went Unnoticed, a podcast where we dive into murder cases that went unnoticed by the nation's newspapers. Hey, Shay. Hi, John. Hi, people. Now, welcome to... Episode three. Episode three. Page three killers. That... We're already on episode three? That's insane. I know, right? How long did it take Star Wars? Oh, I don't know. It took Star Wars, what, like six, seven years to get to episode three? <laughs> no! It took Star Wars something like, what, like 40 years to get to episode three. Because I started on episode four. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right, people. So, today, oh, we have to tell them what our drink special is for today. We do. All right. <laughs> Alrighty, episode three. I was not too impressed with my last performance, so we're going to try an upper game here. Alright, we have the Down Under Spritzer. Alright, I know what you all are thinking. Every single one of these just has to do with where the thing takes place, the murders take place. That's not true in the future, not necessarily. But you guys get to try and figure this one out. Again, this one's pretty easy. Alright, so we're going to start off with a little Chianti. That's a red wine for anyone who's not familiar. It's kind of on the sweet side, so, you know, take it easy. The particular red wine we're having this week is from 19 Crimes. Again, there's a tie-in with that. That's kind of the mystery you guys have to solve. And then after we have our Chianti, we're just going to take two ounces of club soda or tonic. If you're doing a little bit more of a dry red wine, if you're not, if you don't have access to Chianti or you like something else a little bit drier, I suggest a tonic. It's a little sweeter. Very simple recipe this week again. You're just going to mix those two together, your Chianti and your club or your tonic. And then you just put that in a nice little fancy glass. You can top it with some mint and some raspberries or strawberries. Both are pretty tasty. And we have a pairing this week, some food pairings. A little bit of, little bit of pork, maybe some fava beans. Hints, hints. Alrighty, back to the show. All right, so let's dive into this case. Today is episode three. We are talking about Catherine Mary Knight. This case takes us back to the year two thousand. Right at the beginning of the year 2000. Right at the yeah. turn of the... Century? And millennium. Millennium. Ooh. Yeah, that was a big one. We had that Y2K bug that didn't really come to fruition. Yeah, yeah. So people didn't care about that yet. <laughs> that was old news at this point. I know. January 1st, everyone was like, yeah, I can still turn on my TV. But banking still mm. works. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Debit card still works. Next. Yeah. Uh all right, so, but there were some big news. So we're talking to begin, you're right at the beginning. Yeah, when right we at like, the beginning. So we're talking February of 2000? Yep, February of 2000. So we got we got a couple of big news cases that were dominating uh, the headlines at the time of this case. So we had George, George W. Bush? Yeah. Jr.? No, no, his dad was George H.W. Bush. Ah, okay, so we had... Yes, Bush took office for his first term. People were still mad about that because they were still counting... Uh, contested elections. The, the, the contested elections. In case you people aren't listening in real time, yeah. we are uh, we are right at the beginning of the Biden administration, so we know all about those contested elections. Yeah, but you know what? Can't change who's going to be president. All right, so another case that was really big was Elian Gonzalez, who was... Bring Elian! Really on <laughs> and Cuban refugee uh, whose mother uh, did not survive the the yeah so coming to well the you United you didn't States. know anything about this I brought this up I, and you're like that couldn't have been big news I kind of remember it but I didn't realize it was 2000 I thought it was like 1990 <laughs> like for some reason I thought it was when you were two much older I was like oh my gosh I know I was in middle school. So, yeah. uh, I remember this. The free Ileans were everywhere. Yeah. Um, so that's the young boy who came over from Cuba. 
Listen, at this t- at that point, I was busy selling lollipops for some sort of like All right, and war. I was... Actually, you know what? I was I was probably for some war. We weren't <laughs> in the like, war yet. Like, t- well, it was for like refugees. The free Ilion. It was for refugees. Selling um, lollipops to free Ilion. You didn't even know some Middle Eastern country. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, so we also had the bombing of the USS Cole. Again, that was a big deal. Uh, it was also before nine. 19- uh, 9-11, so uh, this is, I was in the Navy, so I spent almost an entire day learning about the USS Uh It was the biggest deal. It changed U.S. naval policy yeah. forever. Uh, so basically what happened was we had these some terrorists who were just on like this little lifeboat, not a lifeboat, like but a like, a, l- like a little blow up raft. Oh, really. wow. And so they, they started approaching the USS Cole, and they told them to, to, you know, to back off, and then they're like, eh, they're not going to do anything. There's some little, yeah. they're just, they're, nothing can happen. Well, they had just a bunch of C4 or whatever on their boat. They got close enough and just blew a hole in the side of the ship. Wow. I forget. I think it killed like 50 people or something like that. Yeah. Ooh. Maybe we'll yeah. have to do, do like a, like a mini, a mini sode on that one. That makes like, no sense. Like do a, like a mini episode. But like, it's a complete opposite of what our... Our podcast is about. Yeah, but that doesn't Everyone mean we can't do mini, mini episodes like little, like, you know, little hidden Easter egg episodes. I guess so. You know? Like, on a t- if, if you guys want to hear more about the bombing of the USS Cole, just slip us a message in our contacts and I'll, we'll do one, you know, if, if that it interests you. Now, at that time, we also had a couple of... Uh, air flight crashes. You had the Kenya Airways Flight 431 that crashed into the Atlantic Ocean on the Ivory Coast of Africa, killing 169 people. Then you had the Alaskan Airlines flight. This one was kind of big. I kind of remember this one. Um, that was Flight 261 that crashed off the coast, uh, California coast into the Pacific Ocean. It killed all 88 passengers and crew. And then That was the year of the Summer Olympics, which was held in Sydney, Australia. So I forgot to mention, guys, that this case happens in Australia. So this is our first international case, babe. Yeah, so it was a really big deal in uh, Down Under. Yeah, I would assume that that this was a pretty big case, especially once we get into the details. You'll start seeing it. It's pretty interesting. But, and you know what? This wouldn't be a Page 3 Killers episode without... The seedier side of 2000. This was actually pretty calm this year. Yeah. Oh, yeah, tw- uh, 2000. I thought you meant this year. I'm like, what? No, no way. No. Um, all right. So on the seedy side of 2000, we have a case that I've heard about a couple of times. Um, and it was kind of a really big deal in Manchester, England. Um, in fact, this is an ongoing case, I, I found out. I did. This I was is not, not resolved. This is not resolved. All right, so we had Dr. Harold Shipman, and he was found guilty of murdering 15 of his patients. They were all elderly between 1995 and 1998. So he was uh, sentenced to life imprisonment in England, and it's believed that he's killed at least 215. They are still exhuming bodies. Yeah, you guys should look up a picture of this guy. He looks like a crazy, like... Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, but he's the crazy side. You know what I don't understand, babe? Everybody says, I couldn't believe that that man was a killer. He seemed so nice. Yet every time you see a picture of them, you're like, oh yeah, that's a serial killer right there. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to say. You're right. I am right. It just It's just so weird that everybody's like, oh yeah, that guy totally looked like a serial killer. But when they talk to people and they're like, everyday lives they're like nah that completely normal person didn't even see it coming all right so let's get into the case so we're going to talk today about Catherine mary knight she was born in october 24th of 1955 now Catherine is the first australian woman to be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole um because of this case so she only committed one murder just one. But once I give you the details of this, your your life is going to be... I don't know if this is going to be like a, a good life-altering 
moment or but it will be altered better for better or worse <laughs> i don't know how australian law works but life without parole isn't that hard to get in america yeah true it's not that hard in america you could, there, but... there's a whole list of crimes you can get life without parole in america if you do them enough yeah so she was convicted of murder not just someone she knew but it was her semi estranged husband so in this case if i didn't explain to you like her past relationships you wouldn't get the trend okay so we're going to i'm going to just start at the beginning for her so catherine was the younger of a set of twins hint hint babe okay you're the older one i got nothing to worry about <laughs> So she's the younger of a set of twins. She was born to her mother, Barbara, and her father, Ken. And they were from New South Wales in Tenerfield. I believe that's how it's pronounced, Tenerfield. But Ken was not Barbara's husband. Barbara's husband was Jack. And Ken was his co-worker. Her mother obviously had an affair with uh, her husband's co-worker, Ken. Once it was found out that, you know, I, Barbara had an affair, her husband basically made her move to Aberdeen um, in New South Wales. I'm sorry. From, from Aberdeen. Aberdeen uh, new, in New South Wales to Moore? Marie. Marie. Okay, so the it's pronounced Marie, New, new South Wales? Yeah. Jack Rowan, uh, who was Barbara's husband, did eventually pass away in not uh, a few years later in 1959 and two of his children moved in with the knight family apart from her twin catherine was not close with anyone else in her family except for oscar knight so she was close to her uncle oscar and he was a champion horseman a couple articles said that she was very impacted by his death uh, he committed suicide in 1969 and she maintained though that his ghost continued to visit her even after death the family moved to aberdeen uh back to aberdeen that year catherine's father ken was an alcoholic and he was abusive violent uh and he often raped her mother up to 10 times a day apparently that's impressive almost i i you know what i guess he might have had like one of those sex afflictions you know where it's like this was way before viagra Catherine also said that you know her mother would often tell them uh, intimate details about her sex life and how much she hated men and knight would complain about this often when interviewed and she her mom told her that she should just put up with it and stop Kim. Well, that's usually good advice, but... You know, maybe not if your mom's telling you about her the inner workings of her sex life. That's well, a little... Well, usually your mom doesn't have to tell you that if that's going on in your household. True. I mean, you probably hear it, depending on how thin the walls are. Uh, Knight also claims that at this time in her early life, around 11, that she was frequently sexually abused by several members of her family... Although she never said her father, like, out of all of the, the males in her family, she never said that about her father. Catherine, by all accounts, was also a pleasant girl who experienced uncontrollable murderous rages in response to minor upsets. So she did have some anger issues. That is exactly the way I describe most pleasant people. <laughs> I know. Occasional... It's just murderous rages yeah when she attended high school she was said to be a loner and she would bully smaller children again very pleasant people this is how i would describe them who yeah. said she was pleasant by yeah. all accounts except for the people she bullied maybe yeah I, I guess maybe some teachers like other students that she did get along with might say that she was pleasant i'm sure the people that she bullied did not find her pleasant at all I also found record that she assaulted a boy at her school with a weapon. They did not specify what the weapon was, though, but that she did assault someone and that she was also one time was injured by a teacher who, after they investigated, found acted in self-defense. 
Again, more pleasant behavior. Yeah, more pleasant behavior. And then she left school at 15, and uh, apparently she did not know how to read or write at that time. After leaving school at 15, she quickly got a job working at a clothing factory as a cutter. She would cut fabric in the factory. And then she got her dream job at a abattoir, which is a slaughterhouse. What's it, what's I understand at a slaughterhouse, but what is that? Um, so that that's just a, another word for a slaughterhouse oh. abattoir, and she was quickly promoted to like deboning and given a set of butcher knives as part of her job. So she had a a nice set of butcher knives. And she hung them over her bed. Yeah, that's so, probably not like, the safest story. And she storage. would say that the reason why she hung them like that was so they would always be handy if I needed them. Oh, see, I'm just imagining them like she's literally hanging them like they're like a mobile, down. like yeah, like, like a baby's mobile. <laughs> that's the first thing I thought of. I was like, that's that might not be the. The best idea, but if she's got them like staged above, like on her like nightstand or I, something. I think I think what it is is that she had them over her bed, like on the wall. Yeah. And they were like displayed really nice. Okay, that's different. So now we're gonna get into her relationships. Now, you can just imagine what her childhood was like. Now, her relationships are terrible to say the least. Okay, so. And it works the other way. You would assume that she would be abused and tormented. It is exactly the opposite. Uh, the first guy that we have, this poor man, uh, David Kellett, met Catherine. He was a co-worker of hers. And they met in 1973. And she was the dominant person in this relationship. She wore the pants. So he did what she told him to, and that's that. Quite often, you know, if he got into a fight at a bar or something, she would be the first person to back him up, and she would have no problem bringing a knife to a fist fight. In Aberdeen, she was renowned for offering armed combat to anyone who upset her. So she had a short temper, and everybody knew it. So I guess try to stand clear, steer clear of her, but... You know, if you got on her bad side, you know, it would be a problem. So, Knight married David in 1974. And her mother, Barbara, gives David some advice. She told him, The old girl said to me to watch out. You better watch this one or she'll fucking kill you. <laughs> Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're fucked. Don't ever think of playing up on her. She'll fucking kill you. And that was her mother talking. She told me she's got something loose. She's got a screw loose somewhere. So. <laughs> Again, pleasant. <laughs> pleasant. And this is her mother telling this to him. Like, I don't know. So. I mean, it's, it's almost what your mother told me about you. Really? Well, yeah, we had our conversation. Don't worry about him. <laughs> so on their wedding night, great start to this <laughs> this marriage. She tries to strangle him. To like, like, like in a bad way. Like in a bad way. Not like, oh, we're getting down to a little little something, something. No, just straight up tries to choke him out. Because he fell asleep after having sex with her three times. They had intercourse three times. And he fell asleep. And as, I guess she wanted to keep going. As he probably should have. <laughs> and I mean, listen, this guy's an alcoholic. <laughs> so, I mean, he's probably tied one on. It's his wedding. Three times is a bit excessive. Well, expecting anything more is a bit excessive. <laughs> Three times. But I, I guess she wanted four. And I get, you know, what just wasn't good enough for her. So she tries to choke him out. And that is not the worst thing that she's about to do. Not too long after that, she, while she was uh, pregnant with their first child, 
she burned all of David's clothing, his shoes, everything, before hitting him across the head with a frying pan because he arrived late home from a darts competition after he made the finals. She hit him over the head with a skillet. He flees the house before collapsing in a neighbor's yard and was treated for a, a skull fracture. So she didn't just like tap him on the head. She slammed his head with that frying pan. You better watch it, babe. Okay. Giving you some side eye over here. All right. So police wanted to charge her with assault. They wanted to charge her with assault. And then she sweet talked David into dropping the charges. She ended up not being brought up on charges on that. So a few months later in May of 1976, after giving birth to her first child, Melissa Ann, David does leave her for another woman and moves to Queensland. And Catherine Knight was diagnosed with postnatal depression. And she spent several weeks recovering from this. But not before, not before she left her two-month-old baby on a railway line to get hit by a train. She also stole an axe, went into town, and threatened to kill several people. A homeless man who would forage near the tracks named Old Ted found Melissa and, from what I read, barely saved her from a train. How is this lady, like, not in jail already? I do not know. I, this is... This is the 70s, I guess. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I guess like it was that. a little bit looser back then, you know, 70s, you know. She's a woman. Yeah. So, at this time, Catherine Knight was arrested. And she was taken to St. Elmo's Hospital. Fire. St. Elmo's St. Elmo's <laughs> Fire, right? That's what you're about to say, St. Elmo's Fire? <laughs> St. Elmo's Hospital. Damn. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, I don't even think I've ever seen that movie. I know my aunt was a fan of it, but I'm pretty sure I have. It's been a long time though. Yeah. So she she was put into that hospital, recovered quite quickly, and signed herself out the following day. Oh, that must be nice. A few days later, not, not very long after that, Catherine slashes the face of a woman with one of her knives and demand that she drive her to Queensland. To find David, her husband. Uh, the woman manages to escape after stopping at a service station. She just, like, gets out and flees. When the police arrive, Knight has taken a child, a little boy, hostage. And is threatening to kill him with the knife. And the police are able to disarm her with some brooms. What? Where are we? This is... The police carry brooms? <laughs> I I read it in the article that they managed... I think it was because they couldn't get close enough to her because she has this knife. They have and guns! I don't think they wanted to use a gun on a woman, especially when she's using a child as a human shield. Continue. I'm over this. <laughs> this lady has gotten so, away... This lady has almost literally gotten away with murder at this point. Yeah, so... Once they disarm her, they, they're like, oh my god, this chick is crazy. She's batshit crazy. So they pack her up to a psychiatric hospital. You would think that it gets all fixed. Um, but no. Uh, so while at the hospital, Catherine tells the nurses that she intended to kill the mechanic at the service station because he had repaired her husband's car, which allowed him to leave her. And then she was going to go and kill both her husband, his mother, and his girlfriend when she arrived in Queensland. This is like the person, the doctor who got hanged because he helped John Wilkes Booth with his broken leg. Yeah. The police informed David of the incident. And what, what would you, what would be the reasonable response to this, babe? From him. From David, what what should this? Has, he finds out that she was planning to murder him. That he she did these horrible things, almost killed her child. You know what? What do you think he should do? Leave his girlfriend and go back. <laughs> no, he shouldn't. But that's what he does. <laughs> 
So, yes, he leaves his girlfriend and moves back to Aberdeen with his mother to support Catherine. Through That's because she's going to kill time. him otherwise. So, she gets released from the psychiatric hospital on August 9th, 1976. And she's released to the care of David and his mother, her mother-in-law. They then move to Woodridge, a suburb of Brisbane, where she starts working at the Dinmore Meatworks, which is in Ipswich. And then on March 6th, 1980, they have another daughter, Natasha Marie. This sounds like a terrible idea. Well, not all lasts. You know, she does end up divorcing him. She leaves him in 1984. And she she moves back in with her, her parents in Aberdeen. And that same year, she's injured at work. Um, and she gets a back injury at her job. Gets hurt there, and she gets put on a disability pension. So now we're about to move in to relationship number two. So now she's divorced her first husband. She starts dating 38-year-old minor. Not a minor as in a child. The first thing I thought of, I was like, oh, was he like 17? I heard those wheels turning in your head and you were like, dude, was this guy like 16 or something? No. Um, he was a he was a like a minor for like coal, that kind of thing. Um, named David Saunders in 1986. That was a good year. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, it was a good year. Yeah, I was born. Oh, it was the best year. That's right. It was the best year for your mom because you're her baby boy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> a few months later, he moved in with her. Like. You don't think that's a little soon? Like, you've known her for, like, two, three months. I I know people who have been known each other for two, three hours and moved into with each other. And she got back to her usual crazy batshit nut stuff. Doing... Cocaine? Uh, what? no. Just having terrible mood swings, being a... She was extremely jealous and... You know, when he was, when she was not able to be around him, she automatically assumed that he was, you know, doing the dirty, dirty with somebody other than her. They would break up a lot and get back together. It was a common theme for her relationship with, with David. They would break up, get back together. So they're permanently on again, off again? Yes. In May of 1987... She cut the throat of his two-month-old dingo puppy in front of him. And the reason why she did it, she said, was it was an example of what would happen to him if he ever had an affair and cheated on her. And she would just slit his throat. She's a, she's a prize. Yeah. I, I, don't, mean... I don't understand why more men aren't with this woman. And then in June of the following year, 1988, she gives birth to her third daughter, Sarah. And Saunders moves in with Knight, and they get they get a nice little house. And it was said that their house was a little unique, cluttered. The, the decorating style was very eccentric and avant-garde. They would... Cover the walls with animal skins, skulls, horns, rusted animal traps, leather jackets, old boots, machetes, rakes, pitchforks, and that included the ceilings. I see nothing wrong with this. They had the ceilings covered with stuff. I, I'm going to start doing this in our house. <laughs> Please don't. We have enough stuff, but it's not this kind of stuff. After an argument... Uh, one time, she hits David in the face with an iron before stabbing him in the stomach with a pair of scissors. He left her at that point, and he moved back to his apartment, which, being smart, he had kept, even after he moved in with her, he had his apartment. Uh, gotta be making bank. He's got an apartment and a house. Well, she she paid for the house. 
her disability. Oh, okay. paid, paid for the house. I, I believe in the articles they said he put the down payment on the house as a surprise or something. And she paid paid the house off herself. So it was it was pretty much her house. And he would just, I guess he would go in between the two places. You know, when they would fight, he would move back to his apartment. Wait, they're not married at this point, are they? No. They got a kid, but they're they, not married. Yeah, they have a kid, but they're not married. How risque. I know. So several months later, he returns to see his daughter and found out that Catherine has gone to the police and got in a apprehended violence order. So basically, it's like a, it's a restraining a order. restraining order. So it's like a PPO or something, or P or a PPA. Uh, I believe that's what they call it here. Um, a per- personal order of protection, a PO POA, personal order of no a PO a POP, personal order of protection. Okay. Yeah. So she basically got one of those um, against him. She got an AVO against him. So that terminates that relationship. He knows she's crazy. He's not going back. Even though they got a kid together. Yeah, even though they got a kid together. Now, moves on to relationship number three. And this is the one right before her last husband. So this is John Chillingsworth. Not much information on this one. He was also a co-worker of hers at the slaughterhouse. And in 1990, she became pregnant with his child. It was a boy, and they named him Eric. Now, while she is dating John, John C., she meets John Price. John P. John P. And... You know, they start their torrid affair. They have a relationship for three years Mild, while she's with John, with the mild, other John. Mildly hypocritical. Yes. So I guess her whole thing was, I can do whatever I want. I can sleep with whoever I want to sleep with, but you can only sleep with me. Kind of thing. Makes sense. So John Chillingsworth breaks up with her. And, you know, so she just picks up her side piece, John Price. Let's, let me give you some information about John Price. Now, John Price had a broken down marriage in 1988. He separated from his wife and they had three children together. He had a two-year-old who remained with his former wife. His other two older children went to live with him. Everyone said that he was a, quote, a terrific bloke, end quote. So, so just like a, he's a like, terrific bloke, like a, like she's a, a model student? No, from what I read, Who you know, he, he was actually like a really great guy, sort of like you. Wasn't a violent person, and he was not aware of Catherine's violent tendency. But he would be, he would be become aware of it very soon. She moves into his house in 1995. His children loved her. They really liked her. You know, they looked up to her. And uh, they they were really close in, in everything that I read. In 1998, they had a fight over... Um, so in, retali- in retaliation... She recorded items that he stole from work. Like, took a little VHS tape of, like, the things he, like, taken from work, which were, like, out-of-date uh, first aid kits. You know, they weren't, like, anything super important at his job. They were just, like, little like little things that they were throwing away anyway. Because he, what he would do was, they call it bin tipping. So it's like dumpster diving. So he would he would go in and he would pull things out of the dumpster that they were throwing away. Which is super not allowed a job. Yeah. So he ends up losing his job, which he had held for 17 years. What? Yeah, because she took this tape, mailed it to his boss, so he lost his job. 
Uh, so then he kicked her out. A few months later, they restarted the relationship, but he wouldn't allow her to move in. So their fighting became a lot more frequent, and he lost a lot of friends because of their, their fighting. So now we're up to February of 2020. Hey, hey, this is when stuff happened. Yes. Yeah, so a series of assaults on John by Wonder Catherine. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, Catherine assaulted him several times. She stabbed him in the chest. How is that only an assault, not like attempted murder? Or at least I, battery. I, I I don't know how they're how it works. But on uh February twenty ninth, he stopped at the Scone uh magistrate's court and got himself a you know, a restraining order against her to protect him and his children. That afternoon, Price told his co workers that if he did not come to work the next day, it would be because Catherine killed him. They pled with him not to go home. They didn't think it was safe. They thought it was a bad idea that if he thought she was going to come and kill him, that he shouldn't go home. Um, but, you know, he didn't want to not go back to his own home. He owns it. It's his place. So when he gets there, you know, his children aren't there. Neither is Catherine. Here she took the children to go for a sleepover at a friend's place. So can't, can't have no witnesses. He got a little creeped out. So he went and spent the evening with his neighbors. And then uh went home to bed around 11 p.m. Now, earlier in the day, Catherine went out, bought some black lingerie. She was going to decide to surprise John, you know, later that night, which is the first thing you should be doing. After you get a restraining order against you. Yeah. So. I'm trying to seduce the person. All right. I am not sure. Okay. The next series of events is really strange. Okay. One. You've gotten a restraining order. Does she still have a key? Because she comes into the house while he is sleeping. Watches some TV. Has a shower. And then gets into bed with him. Maybe he doesn't lock the door. Uh, I'm just like. Uh, I'm just not sure, like, how, how does, I mean, it's, this is 2000, all right? This isn't, like, 1972. This is also where, Australia, you don't know. Where you slept with your doors unlocked. <laughs> like, definitely not. So, somehow she got into the house. I, I'm not sure if he just never changed the locks and forgot she had a key, but he's about to regret it, all right? So she climbs into bed with him, you know, and just starts putting the moves on. While he's asleep? He wakes up. I, I assume that they they engage in some sexual activity. Some naughty naughty? Yeah, some naughty naughty. All I do know is that at 6 a.m. the next morning, the neighbors become concerned because John's car is still in the driveway. And he hasn't left for work yet. Not only that, his employer is a little worried because John hasn't showed up to work yet. So after a little bit, John's boss sends a co-worker to go check on him. Because everybody at work knows what's going on with Catherine. That You know, they don't like her, you know, all that stuff. He done told them. Yeah, he told them, you know, if, if I don't come to work tomorrow, she murdered me. So, a co-worker goes, um, and the na- one of the neighbors is there. So, they both decide that they're going to go up to the house together. Both go up to the house. They knock on the door, and they don't get a reply. They walk around the house and look through his bedroom window and to see if they could wake him up. And they notice there's blood everywhere just everywhere so they call the police now the police arrive at 8 a.m and they have to break down the back door police don't just find his body there they find Catherine sleeping 
next to his dead body in an apparent overdose. So everything I read said that she had taken a large number of pills. I'm going to assume that she tried to overdose after doing all this, but it was not very successful. They just found her knocked out. Now, they are looking at the everything, you know, obviously she's in police custody now. They are just looking at everything, and it is apparent that she stabbed Price with a butcher knife while he was sleeping. And the blood evidence showed that he had woken up, turned the lights on, before attempting to escape. They can see from the blood evidence that she chased him through the house. He managed to get the front door open and get outside where he must have collapsed. And she dragged him back into the house, into the hallway, where he did finally bleed to death. But they did find him on the bed. So she pulled him all the way back to the bedroom and put, him, put his body on the bed. Then she goes out, takes his ATM card, and she withdrew $1,000. I have no idea what she did with the $1,000 because I'm pretty sure she didn't get to spend it. Now, when they do his autopsy, they find that she stabbed him at least 37 times in the front and back of his body. And many of the wounds hit vital organs. 37 times? That's... Mm -hmm. that's, that's a lot of stab wounds. Yeah. Several hours after Price died. Which is also a butcher, so she knows exactly where to stab. Exactly. So, not only, you know, did she stab him, and God knows what else she did, but here's what we do know she did. She skinned him. She, she like, cut off some of his skin and hung it on a meat hook on the back of the lounge door. She then de decapitated his dead body and cooked parts of his body. Police said that when they searched the rest of the house, they found, like, the, the table was set for three people. Two of the seatings had plates down with what looked to be meat, potatoes, pumpkin, zucchini, cabbage, yellow squash, and gravy, along with notes for John's two children. What did the notes say? It had their names on it. Marking which which was their seat. I wonder if this was like normal behavior in their household. I I do not know. They did find a third plate which was thrown out on the back lawn, and they believed it was because uh, she attempted to eat it and it she couldn't eat it and just like threw it outside. They found John's head in a pot with vegetables on the stove, and it was still warm. They said uh, it was estimated to be between 40 and 50 degrees Celsius when they found it. And then they found a handwritten note from Catherine on top of a photograph of John. It was stained with blood and had pieces of flesh on it. And the note read, time got you back, Jonathan, for raping my daughter. You too, Beck, which was one of John's daughters. For Ross, for little John, now play with little John's dick, John Price. So, those accusations were found to be groundless. Her children deny that he ever touched them. I She's wonder, insane. I wonder if she's just, like, losing touch with reality. Oh, yeah, most and, like, definitely. she's just, like... We're about to talk about the trial. You know, everything that goes into the trial. But she was sentenced for uh for life in prison um so for her trial knight in uh initially offers to plead guilty to manslaughter um but that plea was rejected by the court they said no so she was arraigned on february 2nd of 2001 2001 for the murder of john price she then enters a plea of not guilty. The trial is set for October 15th. Now, 
when they start putting together the the jurors for this. So they they bring in 61 people. They they end up having a very limited jury pool when it comes down to it. So when they start getting into everything, her attorney starts noticing that we have a problem. The jurors are obviously not they see the pictures of what she did to John's body. And there's no way that they're not going to find her guilty. No way. No possible way. So Ain't, ain't no amount of blood dyers going to ever get you out of this one. Exactly. So her attorney talks her into switching her plea to guilty. <laughs> like, just straight up, we can't win this. I need, I need you to take the knee <laughs> on this one. Just well, yeah, name. just get the death. Well, I don't know if they have the death penalty. They, one, they do not. It's they it's not. Australia. So uh, wait, so she pled guilty and still got the harshest possible punishment. Yeah. Usually, that's like the whole point of pleading guilty is like you just get the harshest punishment yeah. off the table. So she pleads guilty, and the judge dismisses the jury, saying that you know they don't need them. Um, but Justice O'Keefe, the the judge for the case. Decides that, you know what, I need, she needs a psychiatric assessment to, just to make sure that she understands what the consequences of pleading guilty are, and to make sure that she understands what making that plea means for her. So her legal team planned to defend her by claiming am- amnesia and disassociation. A claim uh, that was supported by most uh, psychiatrists, although they did consider her sane at the time that she committed the crime. She understood it was wrong, but she still refused to accept the responsibility of her actions. She just straight up was like, I didn't do it. So she pled guilty without allocution? Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, again, I'm not an expert on Australian jurisprudence. I don't know if they have to allocute. Usually that's how they... they yeah. All, like, once most, you've allocated, that basically means you're not crazy. Yeah. So, they move uh, into sentencing. And Knight's lawyer's like, listen, I don't want my client here, so can we just not include her in it? And the judge says... No, she has to be here. He's probably scared he's going to get... <laughs> yeah, the application was refused. So when Dr. Timothy Lyons takes the stand and describes the skinning and decapitation of John, Catherine goes nuts. She just goes so crazy that she has to be sedated. If I'm just like the lawyer, I just look at the judge and go, I told you so. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how far that'll go in that, you know, their I court, know. but. I'm pretty sure right there, like here in the United States, they would have been like, you would have been like, I told you so. You, and they're just like, you're in contempt of court. <laughs> you just know the judge <laughs> is looking, the judge is just like looking down at the, like he's got his head in his hand and he just looks at the, uh, the, the lawyer and he's just, like, mouthing the words, I'm sorry. Yeah. Because he doesn't want it to go on record, so, like, the stenographer can't catch it. Mm-hmm. But. So, on the 8th of November, Justice O'Keefe pointed out that the nature of the crime and Catherine's lack of remorse required the severest penalty, which was life in prison. Well, at that point, see, but here's the point. Then you just go... Uh, uh, not guilty. And then she's like, pleaded not guilty. Yeah, but the problem was that they, they couldn't find jurors that wouldn't find her doesn't not matter. guilty. doesn't matter. Like, at that point, you just go, I will <laughs> waste the court's time if yeah. you do that. And that's, the, like, that's the whole point of pleading guilty, is to get that penalty off the table. So, a few years down the road, in 2006, she applies for an appeal of the life sentence that she received, claiming that the penalty of life in jail without the possibility of parole was too severe for simply killing one person. The justices that review this case could take one look at it 
and they dismissed the appeal, stating that it was an appalling crime, almost beyond contemplation in a civilized society. And that was a quote from Justice McClellan. I, I think it's absolutely ridiculous that you would think that appealing... I mean, this wasn't just a murder. This was... What do you mean? Of course you appeal. You don't know what kind of... Like, in the off chance that the judge is just having a wonderful day. Yeah. I don't know. And he's just but feeling... Especially, you know... The, just just the, the sheer brutality of this. Like, you... And plus, you gotta look at her history. That no one really cares about. Yeah. How many charges did she have placed against her I, prior to this? Not a single one. Not a single one, no. There's not a single... There, like, there might be... A few police records? Yeah, probably the calls that went out. Uh, like, I guess, uh, is it 999? Is I know that's England, is 999, right? Uh, what really is the Google. Australian 911? What, what is Australian If you guys know what that is, please send it to me. I Like, what, what are, like, the 911 codes for other countries? Like, like I, I know, but this is why we got Google. He John's Googling it for you guys right now. The Google machine has... Oh, triple off. Triple zero? Triple off, yep. So they were like, zero, 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 this bitch is trying to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, but that, that brings us up to current today. So as of right now, she is serving her life sentence at Mulawa uh, Correctional Facility. And she cleans basically the warden's office. You know, she's a cleaner um, as like one of her jobs. They said that she is a great cook. But it is highly unlikely that she will ever have a job in the kitchen there. Mainly Yeah, she, you can't give her access to what she, out knives. She stabbed a bitch. Like, she stabbed multiple people. I don't know. I, don't, I, I work in a lot of prisons and I don't. It always bothers me because all these... They always, uh, like, the the main cook, like, whoever is running it, usually does the knife prep work before the prisoners can come in and actually cook. So they do all the, the prep work. It, at least I know that in England they do. I don't know. I don't see anyone else working in those kitchens except for prisoners. But the thing is, all the guards eat that food, too. I'm just yeah. like, I don't know. If I was the I guy know. who slammed you up against the, the, the wall the other day. Yeah. Well, am like, I what are you doing to my food? You? Yeah. Yeah, but at that point, I guess you don't care. Yeah, so that is Catherine Mary Knight. One crazy. I You know what? I think if, like, you were on, like, good terms with this woman, she would be a hoot. You know, well, she likes to party. She sounds like a pleasant woman. As long as you stay on her good side. I wonder if she ever learned how to read. I I I, I don't know. That would be interesting to find out. Um, yeah, so this case, I guess, was really big in Australia. I had never heard of it. Hey, remind me never to move to the Wake Islands. The Wake Islands? Why? Yeah. There is no telephone emergency system. <gasps> Well, how so, many civilians do they have? I have no idea. I've never heard of the Wake Islands. <laughs> but I just found that out looking up. Okay. All right. Well, that is it for this episode. We hope you guys enjoyed uh, enjoyed your drink with us um, and enjoyed the episode. Please let us know how you think we're doing. Drop us an email. Or an email, you can email, DM us, DM you can us. post you on can, Facebook page. You can leave a comment and like this video. Like, share, and subscribe. Smash that like button. <laughs> God, I hate that saying. I know. It's so overused. You can't even, Every it's, it's, single podcaster uses it. No, it's not applicable to podcasts. Like, well, it's the, the YouTube videos. All right, guys. Well, we're going to let you guys go. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Remember. Oh, anyone from oh. Australia, tell us how stupid we are. Yeah, please, please tell us the correct pronunciation of those words. We know we, I butchered them, so please correct me so that, and I'll, I'll do like a video apologizing. <laughs> so remember, guys, stay sexy and don't get murdered.